scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. May I request that we lift our hands to heaven and ask the Lord to visit us and to give us an encounter even by his word. Is someone praying? Please lift your voice, lift your hands to heaven. The Bible says, for everyone that asketh, receive it. Someone is asking the Lord for an encounter. Oh, be lifted. Above all other gods, we lay our crown and worship. You be lifted above all other gods, we lay our crown and worship. Sing all oh, glorious God, all oh, glorious God, we praise your name. We lay our crown. One more time. Sing all oh, glorious God, all oh, glorious God. We praise your name. We lay our crown and worship. Father, we ask that you speak to our hearts tonight. And in the name of Jesus, may your word come with fire. Lift us to higher levels in the name of Jesus. And let the revelation that you have in store for us indeed let it be sent with precision and accuracy and to you be all the glory for in Jesus much less name we pray God bless you and thank you please be seated hallelujah hallelujah I'm teaching along the theme Psalm 24, and we'll read verse 7 to 8 for reference, and then we'll begin to teach Psalm 24. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? This were the gates asking now. So the gate, even though ancient, they said, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. He's giving definition and he's giving perspective to this king of glory. The Lord mighty in battle. Verse 9, reading to 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. The last verse. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. I'm teaching tonight on 
the topic the Lord strong and mighty the Lord strong and mighty and for our introduction I would like to state here I wrote here that the quality of your Christian experience the quality of your Christian experience and your faith work is dependent on your experience with God our fathers have taught us the Bible has taught us that the quality of your work with God your faith adventure is directly proportional to the experience that you have with God your exploits depends on your encounters the Bible is full of men who had encounters with God and we see from Scripture the corresponding exploits that validated those encounters. Are we together? That means for two believers saved by the same God, they may have different experiences which is a reflection of the kind, the quality and the depth of encounters that they had had with God. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, the verse 32, the B part for the sake of time, it says, but the people, not everyone, the people that do know their God, not that do know God, their God, it says two things will happen to them as a testament that they know God. Number one, is strength, capacity, stamina. Number two is that their life will be a plethora of different shades of exploits. Are we together? So the people that do know their God, the condition for strength and for exploits is your experience with God. Is God speaking to us already? So if I desire a life that demonstrates strength, and capacity a life of exploits the bible recommends the pathway as having an experience with god this is the first information that i want us to have tonight the second thing i want us to have tonight is that god reveals himself dimensionally exodus chapter 6 please give us from verse 1 we'll read down to 3 God reveals himself dimensionally. God is almighty. He fills all and in all. But in revealing himself to his sons and daughters, he fragments himself into different dimensions so that we can learn him progressively. Are we together? In Exodus chapter 6, beginning from verse 1, this was an encounter between the God of the Bible and Moses. Then the Lord said unto Moses, the Bible says, Now shall thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. He says, For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Verse 2. And God spake to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. He's revealing himself now. Verse 3. Can we read verse 3 together if you can see it projected? Ready? One to read. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. The same God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Almighty but he did not reveal that dimension of him as Jehovah. Are we together now? One of the ways that we know God, now, theologically speaking, there are four biblical ways to know God. The Bible says in John 17 and verse um, 3, it says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus whom thou hast sent. There are four biblical pathways to knowing God. Number one is through scripture. The Bible says, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scripture, which is able to make you wise, even unto salvation. So we learn God through scripture. In the knowledge of scripture is a revelation of the character of God. Number two, we know God by studying his names. 
It is in the character of God to capture his dimensions when he reveals dimensions of himself. That dimension is preserved in a name so that any generation that wants to see that dimension will study that name. When Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he said, pray thus, our Father, which art in heaven, then he says, hallowed be thy name. The word hallow means we give reference to the various dimensions that consist in you. We are not careless. We do not neglect them. Jaira will provide for you. I mean, um, Jaira will provide, but he will not bring you healing. If you want healing, you must study Rafa. Are we together now? Now listen, listen carefully. Rafa can bring you healing, but it would not, uh, it would not bring out a Christ-like personality in you. You have to study Sikenu, the righteousness of God. So God fragments himself into different dimensions. We know him by learning his names. The third way we know God as revealed from the Bible is by studying Jesus. Jesus who is the incarnate of the Father. Are we together now? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, when you begin to read from verse 1, it says, God who in sundry times and diverse manners spake to us in time past through the prophets had in these last days spoken to us through his son whom he had appointed to be heir of all things. Is that true? The Bible calls him the express image of the invisible God and upholding all things by the word of his power. So it's important for us to know that one of the reasons why Jesus came to the earth was not just to die for our sins. Are we together? Jesus came to reveal the Father. He came as a manuscript to correct our understanding about the invisible God we never met. There were many things in the Old Testament that were attributed to God. It was the ignorance of the prophets because they saw in part and they prophesied in part. So Jesus came as a correction of our understanding about God. Are we together? Everything that God was, we have a right to judge it and vet it using the reference Jesus. So when the Bible says God is love, I have a right to reject that statement until I find that statement captured in Jesus. Everything the prophet said God was and we did not see in the life of Jesus. We have a right to question it. So Jesus came as perfect theology. The father had this verdict about Jesus that he was his beloved son in whom he was well pleased. Are we together? And the final way we learn God from scripture is through experience. Job said the things that I've heard now my eyes have seen. There is a place for experience in knowing God. So back to our discussion. That number one, the quality of your Christian experience and your faith adventure is dependent on your experience with God. And then number two, that God in revealing himself to the saints, he reveals himself dimensionally. Are we together? Dimensionally. Now we will understand Psalm 24. Now, if you really want to understand what happened in Psalm 24, this was a discussion that was about ownership and dominion in the earth. Verse 1 says the earth is the Lord's. Number 2, the fullness talks of the resources. Number 3, the walls, the mind control system. Number 4, the inhabitants. Are we together? It says, for he has founded it upon the waters and established it upon the sea. And then it says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? It says, he that has clean hearts and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. As a result, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Are we together? Then he says, this is the generation of them that seek you in the similitude of Jacob. That's another discussion. You have to go and study Jacob as God's, he, God personifies his pattern for encounters using the man Jacob. That means if you want an encounter with God, the biblical figure for your study is Jacob. Then he now says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. This right here was a prophetic statement that was speaking about the Messiah, Jesus. 
Are we together? This was a discussion that was happening at his resurrection. We may not have the time to look there, but it's important for us to understand the perspective. These gates and doors are not metallic objects. The gates and doors were spirits. Are we together now? The Bible says there are gates and there are doors. Remember Jesus was speaking and he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And he says, The gates of hell. So the word gates there is a prophetic expression. It does not just mean bars. Mm -mm. They are spirits. These are the spirits that interface the realm of the spirit and the earth. And according to the law of territory, if you lose this body, if there is a separation between your body and the spirit, you are no longer authorized to return until someone on earth calls you back. Are we together now? It is impossible for resurrection to happen until someone who is on earth calls you back. Now, nobody was calling Jesus back, and yet he was coming. So the gates had a right to question him. Are we together now? When Lazarus died, it took someone who was already in the earth domain because dominion was not given outside the earth. The jurisdiction of dominion is the earth here. So by what authority... Who is this guy without somebody calling him? No human being was participating in his resurrection. The gate said we will not open. It is against the law. We are ancient gates. Everybody we allowed to enter here was by a decree from someone in the earth. That's why the gate said, who is this king of glory? Who is this king? We've not heard about him. We've heard about Lazarus. We've heard about the young boy. We've heard about all kinds of people. But who is this one called the king of glory? And there was an answer from heaven. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in what battle? You go to the Pauline epistles to learn. Haven't spoiled principalities and powers. This is it now. He made a public show of them triumphing over them in judgment. It's in your Bible that he went to Hades and preached the gospel to the saints that were trapped there. They believed in him and he led them forth triumphantly as the firstborn among we the begotten. He was no longer the only begotten son. So this discussion here was at the point of resurrection. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, amen. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, I wish I had time to deal with this scripture. Do you know the beginning of Psalm 24 is a context about ownership. The kings of the earth were growing in pride, claiming and fighting land. And there was a need to settle the issue of ownership of the earth. So a condition was given. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? The person who qualifies to do that, the earth is really his own. Are we together? No man could pass that test except he who is called the king of glory. And the Bible says the dimension of him that qualified him to be called the king of glory is that he is the Lord strong and mighty. The fact that he has strength and might is what gave him the credence to be called the king of glory because kings in ancient times did not become kings by election it was by conquest are we together they were deserving of their positions in and through conquest let's look at a few things and then we'll pray to understand God I wrote here as the king of glory you may want to write please to understand God as the king of glory you must understand the extent of his power and might. You will never truly understand God as the king of glory until you understand him as the Lord strong.
and mighty. That means if you want to understand that he's the king of glory, you have to explore the vastness of his power and his might. Let's look at a few scriptures that talk to us about the extent of the power of this great God. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. Let's rush for the sake of time. It says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth. How? By thy great power. It was not by suggestion you made the heavens and the earth. It took power for the earth to come into being. It says, And thy outstretched arm, there is nothing that is too hard for you. Please say amen. amen. Psalm 62 and verse 11. Psalm 62 and verse 11. 62 and verse 11. 11. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. He was not given. It is his own. Now, the dominion of the saints, there are two levels of dominion. There is absolute dominion and there is shared dominion. The dominion that the saints have is not absolute dominion. Our dominion is derived from our relationship with God. That means we have to depend on him for our dominion to be functional. Are we together? But his dominion is absolute dominion because the Bible says in the beginning, God. That means the beginning met God there. It's not that he was in, we, we were products of the beginning, but he produced the beginning. So his dominion is absolute. I have spoken once, twice I, have I heard that all power belongs to God. Do you know why it is important for you to study the vastness of God's power? So that when you know him as the Lord strong and mighty, you will be able to believe him for anything in your faith adventure. Scripture number 3, Deuteronomy chapter 26 from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 26, it says, And the Egyptians, and the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. We're reading to 9, verse 7. It says, and when we cried to the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked upon our affliction and our labor and our oppression. Verse 8. And the Lord brought us forth out with a mighty hand. Say mighty hand. It says, and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and wonders. Verse 9. And he had brought us into this place and had given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. That's how powerful God is. He can bring you out of, into. Let me say it again. He can bring you out of, into. So if you see me in a realm that I was not there yesterday, don't ask who brought me there. The mighty God who can bring men out. That means where you are right now, it is possible that by this time tomorrow, the king of glory would have shifted you. May that be your testimony in the name of Jesus. He brought us out of. There are people who can bring men out of. But it takes power to bring you into. I can take you out of trouble. But can I bring you into prosperity? The one who has the power to take men out of, my goodness. This is already a revelation for someone that no matter where you are, you know that God can change your life. He can take you. Get it as a revelation. The king of glory takes men out of, then into. He can take you out of a rented apartment and into your Rehoboth. He can take you out of a life of weakness and spiritual bankruptcy into a life of strength. Don't ask how Saul becomes Paul. He met the one who takes men out of, into. There is nothing you cannot do. Mm. Listen to what you are singing. If he has said it, then he... Let me explain to you what you just said. 
the patient. That means it is sin to say what you cannot do. The Bible says every man who ministers should minister according to the measure of grace. That means if you say what is higher than your level of grace and anointing to you, it is sin. Every man sustains the ability to vet his level in the spirit before speaking. The Bible says when God speaks, he finds out whether he's able to make what he says come to pass. So anything you hear God say is the conclusion of testing that reality against his power. That means if God looks at you and calls you victorious, the, the power dimension that makes that word not look like a lie is released immediately. The Bible says, and God said, and he saw, and that what he saw was good. That is the litmus test for spiritual power. When you say it, and it becomes, and what becomes is good. A centurion said, for I am a man under authority, having men under me. I say to one, go, and he goeth. I say to another, come. He said, you too, I know you are under the authority of heaven. Speak the word only. And he said, who taught you this? I've not found this kind of faith, this understanding. Who mentored you this much to know the power of the spoken word that you can say something? Let me stand upon the grace of our Father and speak over someone's life. In the name that is above all names, I speak to you by the power that raised Christ from the dead. Everything that represents reproach, may the King of glory drive it like smoke before the wind. Please sit down. Are we together? Let's pay attention so we can find somewhere to pray. So the Bible says to understand the implication of God being the king of glory, you have to study his strength and study his might. That is the basis of him being enthroned as the king of glory. The king of glory must be the one who is strong and mighty. The one who is not strong and he's not mighty cannot be the king of glory. What is the result of this revelation? What does it mean to know God as strong and mighty? There are three things that this revelation does to your Christian work, your faith adventure. Knowing God as strong and mighty, having a revelation of the vastness of his power and his might. There are three things it does to you. Very quickly, let me run through them. Number one, the result of knowing God as strong and mighty, studying the vastness of his strength. Number one, it imparts upon you the spirit of faith. The first assignment of that revelation of the Lord God being strong and mighty is that it imparts upon you the spirit of faith. It gives you the confidence to live out your divine destiny without fear. We live in a world where it is human to bully people based on all kinds of biases and prejudices. But when you know that the one who backs you is the one who is strong and mighty, it gives you audacity. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no guarantees anywhere in life. This is the victory that overcometh the world. Not your uncle, not your auntie, not even your certificate, even your faith. Faith being the name given to the conviction you have about God. I know whom I have believed, he said, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day. Hebrews chapter 11 archives the exploits of those that the Bible in simple terms does. It starts from verse 1 by saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It calls it the evidence of things not seen. It says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3 says, through faith we understand. We were not there, but we know through faith that the walls, the aeons were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things that do appear. When you now read on, it says, time will fail me to talk of Gideon and Jephthah and Barak, men who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, women received their dead back to life. The exploits of faith. 
I believe him. That is the conclusion of a revelation of his might. Because you see, when you make bold verdicts, life was already authorized to test it. Before you stand before Pharaoh, make sure you have had an encounter with the Lord strong and mighty. Because Pharaoh also is a wizard. Giving him an information that you met God will not scare him. Make sure you have the evidence of the rod becoming a serpent. Make sure you have the power to turn water to blood. And all this happens when you encounter the God of the Bible. The three Hebrew boys said, we love you and we respect you. But as touching the matter of our faith, O oh king, it is because we respect you. It's not because we are weak. We will not bow. There is something we know about God. Faith. A fearful believer is one who has not had an experience with the Lord who is strong and mighty. There is something about the might of God that if revealed, as a man of God, you will know that the only limitation you have is process and the voice of the Spirit, not obstacles. Because the Lord strong and mighty. As a businessman, you can know that God sustains the ability to take you how far and to take you ever far and that on the strength of that revelation. So let's tie up a few things that I've said now. That number one, the extent of your exploit in this kingdom depends on your experience with God. Are we together now? Yes. That you are able to be strong in this kingdom to the degree to which you know your God. Number two, that in revealing himself to men, God reveals himself dimensionally. Are we together? He fragments himself into different dimensions that are captured and preserved in his names. So every name of God contains within it an experience. And when you explore that name, with it you explore an experience that will give you experiential knowledge about God. You cannot know the king of glory until you know the one who is strong and mighty. And I said the blessings that follow the revelation of the strength and the might of God is number one, an impartation of the spirit of faith. Let's read Daniel chapter 3. I'll handpick a few verses for the sake of time. Daniel chapter 3, let's do 15 and 16, then we'll jump to 19 and see how far we'll go. Now, this was the story of the three Hebrew boys being compelled to bow to that 90 feet stature. Now, if ye be ready, that at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, and all of that, it says, ye fall down and worship the image I have made. Listen to an audacious statement. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And then the king made a mistake and made a very arrogant statement. And who is that God that shall deliver you from my hands? And the patience of the young boys was stretched. Next verse, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you on this matter as questioning the might and the power of this God that we represent. Verse 17. It says, if it be so, our, good, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning foreign fires and he will deliver us out of your hand. 18 says, even if he chooses not to deliver us, let it be known to you that we will not bow. When you read from verse 19 to 30, the king was aggrieved, are we together, on the strength of what they had said. And he made them to make the fire seven times hotter to the extent that those who threw them died of that fire. Your spiritual experience will be a reflection of your knowledge of God. Two people can step into the same situation and their realities will be defined by the God they know, not the situation they are in. Are we together? So it is possible for two believers to have the same experience. One will triumph as if the devil does not exist. The flames of the fire kill those who 
who made it hotter. And yet the Bible says the three Hebrew boys, when they entered, they were moving around their hands, their bands, you know, were loosed. And that they saw the likeness of the fourth one looking like the son of God. At the end of it, you will see that a verdict and a decree came. He made a very strong decree that honored the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say the Lord strong and mighty. Apostle, what guarantee do I have that I will live a great life? There are no physical guarantees, sadly. There are no governmental guarantees. There are no educational guarantees. There are no sociological guarantees. Vain is the help of man. Your guarantee is the revelation. Are we together? Hmm. The revelation. So God can send you to a place where you do not have any human connection. And you know the one who sent you. He said, when I sent you, lackest thou anything. Because the Lord, strong and mighty, stands before you like a mighty, terrible one. Are we blessed? For sake of time, you may write this down just for reference. We look at the story of David and Goliath. We may not have the time to read, but please write for reference. First Samuel, when you read First Samuel, from verse 1 Samuel um, 16 down to 17, you read everything, the entire verse. It talks about the young, the young boy David. Now David was a shepherd. Are we together? And in carrying out his duty, he experienced something about the God who was strong and mighty. With that strength upon him, he tore the mouth of the bear and the lion. One time, this six-footed beast called Goliath of Gath was threatening even the warriors of Israel. And Saul, alongside his men, the Bible records, they were afraid and he kept threatening them every day. Bring me a man that I would fight. And the young boy went to serve his brother's food as a teenager. And he heard the beast roaring. And he said, please, can I know what is going on there? And he said, this man is looking for a man to fight him. And he stood with confidence and said, what shall it be done to this man? He was already discussing the rewards because as far as victory is concerned, now you need to understand the stature. Listen, listen, listen. You need to understand the stature of the man he was talking about. Six fingers, six toes. Goliath of God. The brothers were angry and they said, leave this place. He said, let me tell you something I've not told you. I am not standing on my own strength. One time while I was a shepherd, the lion came. I know what the king can do even in the jungle. This man, the king of glory, who is strong and mighty, even mighty through me, is able to act valiantly over this man. Finally, he convinced Saul. And when he stood there, Goliath came like every other day and saw a tiny boy. Don't blame Goliath. I would do the same thing. He said, am I a dog? I will kill you, but at least respect me. Let me know I fought, not played. You thought David would keep quiet. When he was done talking, David said, listen now. You come to me with your spheres and bows, but I come in a name. Hold on. Life will treat you based on what is the basis of your advancement. You can come in a certificate. You can come in a connection. David said, I would be stupid to fight you with a sword. I come in a name. My weapon is the name. Someone you need to hold that name and take it and with it, that is the name that will build you the house. It is Jaira that will build the house, not cement and block. Uh -uh. It is Rafa that will bring the healing. We confront challenges with the dimension of God that has been preserved for our learning and our growth. This is why we wax valiant based on revelation. I come to you in a name. And then he now went further to prophesy. He understood James chapter 2 and verse 26 that a body without a spirit is dead. He had killed the spirit by that boldness. He knew that Goliath was a body and if without a spirit, he's dead. And he said, let me tell you what will happen to you. I will bring you down with this link. When you are down, it is your own sword that I will use and I will feed your flesh to the birds. And Goliath said, all right. The Bible says he ran towards him. 
the people that do know their God run towards him run towards him run towards him the spirit of faith is the first effect of having the revelation of the Lord who is strong and mighty are we together number two what is the second effect in fact let me wrap up this first one Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 Paul was mentoring the church in Ephesus and having strengthened them across a, a number of, of, of faith areas. He now tells them in 6 verse 10, he says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Do you know what that means? Out of the abundance of that revelation you have had, Amplified says, draw your strength from your union with him. Let the awareness that you are one with him, let it strengthen you and give you audacity. Draw your strength. Be empowered through your union with him. There are people who will rise from these meetings who will do things that when people ask you, the only thing you will be able to say is to call the name that backed you. Listen, we are not much in ourselves. The Bible clearly tells us that our sufficiency is not of ourselves. Are we together? The amplification factor in the life of any man doing exploits is the name he has found. The name of the Lord is so mighty it can become a strong tower that the righteous will enter and he is saved. A strong tower is not the only thing the name of God can become. It can become a shield and a defense. Are we together? Aaron was commanded to bless the nation of Israel and the Lord said upon that blessing he will put his name. And that is the reason why they will be blessed indeed. Because his, in, his name is upon the speaking. Number two. What is the second effect of having the revelation of the Lord strong and mighty? Are you ready? Supernatural empowerment to demonstrate the might and the power of God to your world. So the first implication is access to the spirit of faith. Second is supernatural empowerment. Supernatural empowerment to demonstrate the might and the power of God to your world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, the Bible clearly tells us that we are ambassadors an ambassador is an extension of the conviction, an extension of the value and the promoter of the interest of another. Is that true? When you call someone a brand ambassador, it means everything about the life of that person should reflect who he's representing. So if it is true that we are ambassadors, then if he is the Lord strong and mighty, it means captured within the frame of your Christian experience should be a revelation of that truth. Not just from God, but through you. We are ambassadors, the Bible says. Are we together? In Romans chapter 15 and verse 19, the Bible tells us how to preach the gospel fully. Let's read together. Ready? The complete gospel is that which captures the dimension of God. The power of God must be represented in your gospel for it to be complete. Through mighty signs and wonders, he says, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Elyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. That means if the only thing I say is the message, it is not complete. It must be the message and the power component revealed even in my gospel. Are we learning? In John chapter 4 and verse 48, Jesus was speaking and he said, Except ye see signs and wonders, he said, ye shall not believe. There is a world and a generation that is clamoring for an experience of God. Are we together? The way God designed his system and his economy is that his words precede his power, but they are never alone. Every time you see the word of God, behind it, the power of God is following. 
in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus was speaking to them. Remember when he resurrected, he gathered them and for a period of 40 days, he kept teaching them on the matters of the kingdom. And they asked him a question. They said, will you at this time restore the nation of Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the father has put within his care. Verse 8 says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He said they would receive power. And he says, the power will make you a witness. That means it takes more than being there to be a witness. It takes more than seeing what happened to be a witness. It takes power to be a witness. You will be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. One last scripture. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 33, I love this scripture. It has inspired me for many years. It says, and with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon how many? There are certain things in the spirit that are for some, like the fivefold he gave unto some. But when it has to do with access to power and grace, great grace can come on them all. Are we blessed? I wish I had the time I would have explained something a bit about the power of God that I think respectfully speaking we're not really getting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, Paul again mentoring the church in Ephesus, he made a very instructive statement. He says, but unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, he says Christ is the power of God. The word Christ there comes from the word Christos, the anointed. It also means the anointing. So when the anointing of the Spirit is revealed, it has a twofold operation. The anointing is revealed as the power of God and the anointing is revealed as the wisdom of God. Are we together? There are people whose problems do not require power. It requires the anointing but as the wisdom of God. So when you fall under the anointing and stand up, you need to find out what you received. For someone, it may be that what came upon you is the wisdom and the insight. Speaking about wisdom, he said, by me, kings reign and princes decree justice. He says, with me are riches, wealth, and honor, yea, durable riches and righteousness. Most times, our focus on the power, the, the charisma, that, that dimension of and sometimes we do not, we rob ourselves of the wisdom of God. When the anointing is revealed, you must look forward to these twofold dimensions. Revealed as the power of, if you are sick, you don't need the wisdom of God there. What you need is the power of God as his ability to correct and adjust things. Are we together? But there are decisions, destiny decisions. They don't require power. They require wisdom. When you know the Lord strong and mighty, you can access realms of power and realms of wisdom that are way beyond your level of exposure, way beyond even your physical orientation. This is why when they match your result to your personality, if it is God that helped you, it should not match. Are we together? Yes. If they look at your exploits and look at who is behind it, something should look unfair there as a proof that you have outsourced the wisdom wherein you have used for that exploit. Someone shout amen. amen. So, the spirit of faith, number two, gives you access to the anointing, the power of God. Spiritual empowerment is very important in our faith adventure. Number three, very quickly and then we'll pray. Has God blessed someone? What is the third implication of having that revelation of the King of Glory as the Lord strong and mighty? I wrote down here, the third effect, the third implication is that praise will continually rise from the world of men unto the King of Glory. When you have a revelation of the power and the might of God, it will compel praise perpetually. Every time you study scripture, you will see that when there was a display of the manifold power and the wisdom of God, what emanated from that experience was praise. It is impossible to be silent 
when you see the Lord strong and mighty in action. Let me give you three scriptures and then we'll pray. Psalm 107. The full text is from verse 8 to 32, but I'll just read one or two verses for the sake of time. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Why would they praise him? It tells you the reason. For his goodness and for his wonderful works. Where? To the children of men. You read down to 32, you will find it there. Oh, that men. It's an instruction. It's a strong admonishment that every time you see the goodness of God and his wonderful works done to the children of men, praise must emanate from you. Alas, kadiata. That means praise is not supposed to be something that is mechanical. There is a place where you praise him in advance, but believe me, your life can be perpetually full of praise because your life will be a plethora, an episode of the wonder-working power of God per day. Notice the people who experience the power of God. Even when Jesus asked them to keep quiet, they were too grateful to be silent. There is something about the nature of authentic power. When the Lord strong and mighty is revealed, there is something about the design of the human nature that stops you from being silent in the presence of something spectacular. This is the basis of media. Media sells because of that intrinsic construct in men. It is impossible to see something spectacular and yet be silent. At best, you will select who hears it but you will not be silent. Hmm. Are we together? Praise. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, from verse 25 to 27, then King Darius wrote unto the people, the nations, the languages that dwell in the earth. He's writing a letter now. Peace be multiplied unto you. Next verse, please. I make a decree. Who is speaking now? The king. The once arrogant king who said, let me see who will deliver you from my hand. Now by reason of the wonder-working power of the Lord strong and mighty, he's not ashamed. What an honest king. Even though arrogant, he was honest. In the presence of that which was superior, he used his hand to write and to speak a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. I don't know his name, but I know the individual that has revealed that unique expression of him. I've not had the time to study him. May people call God even by your name. May people say, I... I I don't, I don't know the name of this God, but I have found out that the God of Bishop Wale okay. There is something about the expression of God through his life. The God of Abraham is still the God of Isaac. He's still the God of Jacob, but the dimensions are different. What the God of Abraham will do for you is different from what the God of Isaac will do. Your assignment is to use your lifetime to give God a name brand his name through your walk with him for generations to learn him that at the end of your faith walk you would have introduced a dimension of God as captured by your experience let's wrap up the king is making a decree for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed look at the sermon that one manifestation of power gave a king an orientation without Bible school. In a moment, he learned God through the spec. For someone, your testimony is about to be a devotional for people. <laughs> Listen to what you heard me say. A devotional is not what you read once. That by reason of what God does through your life, someone will be using your life as a template to study God. Paul calls us living epistles. That means your life should be a continuation of someone's Bible study. As he closes his Bible, the study should not close. Something about the workings of God in your life should be the continuity. Someone is feeling guilty that I didn't read my Bible today. At the sight of you, he finds hope and comfort. I can keep learning God from a life that has been able to capture a rich heritage of the Lord strong and mighty. 
But only Yeshua will reign forever. To his kingdom there'll be no end. Listen to this song. There are names. There are titles. There are legends and tales of strength. But only Yeshua will reign forever. To his kingdom there'll be no end. There are thrones, there are kingdoms, there are mountains and there are kings. But only Yeshua will reign forever. To his kingdom there'll be no end. Let's wrap up that scripture, 26. The king is making a decree. Daniel, I make a decree. He says forever his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be unto the end. The last verse, 27. He said he delivered and rescued. This man did not go to church to learn this. He watched God, the Lord strong and mighty walking through a man and it provoked praise that he, he threw aside his reputation to stand and declare the greatness of God. He walked signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Let me wrap up by saying this. The king of glory Cannot be understand, cannot be understood until the Lord strong and mighty is understood. Understanding the King of glory is understanding his might and his strength. He's not a king because he was voted to power. He's a king because no one else can be king. There are people who become kings. I, I was watching the election in Kenya and, you know, they just um, upheld the other party and, you know, by the privilege of God's grace, when I was there, I had the opportunity to meet both parties and to have a discussion with them and just to encourage them for the sake of this. Listen, if there's a verdict, you accept it, this and that and that. But you see, for God, it's not like another party won called Jesus' party or God party by 254 and then there was election malpractice even if God keeps the position there's nobody to take it he shall reign please stand he shall reign he shall reign forevermore Emmanuel God is with He shall reign He shall reign Let me lend a minute or two to make a very important call John chapter 17 and verse 1 the Bible says Jesus lifted up his eyes unto heaven and he prayed and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify now thy son, that thy son may glorify you. When we get to verse 3, he says, And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus whom thou hast sent. There are many keys of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom, but there is only one key to the kingdom. And that key is Jesus the Bible declares there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved are we together and I don't want to take for granted that even though this is a very spiritual gathering that someone is here because the Bible declares that the Lord added daily not as many who should be transformed as many who should be saved first that means everywhere there is a gathering of God's people, there is always someone there sent from God to be saved. 
I'm going to make two altar calls in one right now. Number one, for those who are saying, Apostle, it's an honor to have listened to the things that you have shared. And here at this convention, I've been convicted hearing you speak. I do not know this king. I'm like Darius. I have seen what God has done through our father, Baba Wale okay. But I do not know him for myself. Unfortunately, those who will do exploits are the people who know their God. He can start as someone's God, but the process should later evolve him to become your God. It must never stop as the God of another. He must become your God. They told the woman at the well, we believe not because of what you have said again. We came because of your testimony, but haven't met him. We know that he's now our God. The second group of people are those who maybe you have made this decision at one point in your Christian experience and then for some reason things have gone haywire and right now you know even by the conviction of the spirit. For the Bible says when he the spirit of truth is come he said he will guide you in all truth. He says that he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. And whilst you are seated there the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying you can make it right. I'm going to make a call for these two groups in one. You want to make things right tonight so that you can know the King of glory. He can be strong and mighty in your life. He can be strong and mighty in your destiny. Wherever you are, I will count one to five for sake of time. I want you to leave your seat very confidently and come and stand before the King of glory. I begin my counting now. One. young and old be bold come before the king too win that war of destiny once and for all if you're coming please run if there are people coming from outside let's hurry up so that we can redeem time three believers are you celebrating salvation The King of Glory wants to give you an experience. For the word is nigh thee in your mouth and your heart, even the word of faith which we preach. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess Jesus with your mouth, believing him in your heart, you shall be saved. Come, come to Jesus. Doesn't matter how far. Please come quickly. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back hallelujah listen an altar call is a very serious call most times people come out for altar calls and they don't even say anything they pinch themselves they play around the truth is they are not saved there is a spiritual pattern allocated for the administration of salvation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, when you read from verse 8 to 10, it says there must be an activity between your heart and your mouth for salvation to be administered. Coming is only a way of saving the people and then helping to guide them make that decision. But ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, hear me. It is not coming out that gets you saved. In fact, it is not even a spiritual recitation that gets you saved. The sincerity of this conviction by the Spirit in your heart, then verbalized by your confession of faith, is what qualifies for the administration of salvation. For the Bible says, this is the record, the testament, that God hath given us eternal life. But he constructed the administration of eternal life such that you must encounter the Son to have life. You cannot have this life without meeting the Son. 
So I congratulate you standing upon the grace of our Father. It is an honor to welcome you to this family of faith. May I please request, by the way, for those who are watching by way of television or watching online, you are following from across the globe, right in your home, your office. Here is an opportunity for you to make Jesus Lord of your life. There is no distance, there is no barrier here at this conference under the leadership and the grace of our Father, Bishop Wale Oke, it's my honor to lead you to Jesus. As we pray this prayer, I want you to pay attention and to pray that prayer. For some, you may be listening by way of a rebroadcast. He can come to you in the name of Jesus. Lift your right hand. <coughs> say, this, say this after me. Say it loud and clear. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I declare that I love you. I declare that I believe in you, that you are the son of the living God. I ask you to forgive my sin and I receive your life. I declare that you are my savior, you are my Lord, and you are my king. I also declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight and forever, I am a child of God. I am a recipient of eternal life. I go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' name. Please keep your hands lifted. Father, we thank you. The Bible declares that as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. By the authority of scripture, I declare your sins forgiven. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance, even among them that are sanctified. And according to your confession of faith, I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over your life. You go forward ever and backward never in Jesus' name. May I please request that you follow the counselors. There is a board there. Just follow them orderly. Let's, let's honor them as they go. Please be careful with the crane so it doesn't injure you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them. Because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. Tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching. In the name of Jesus, drought in your life, that even when it is physical rainy season, it is still dry season spiritually, financially and otherwise. I decree and declare, let the rain begin to fall. Let the rain begin to fall. Let the rain.